message this morning, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're, we're going to really launch into the study this morning, but it was interesting as I was studying this first part of this, it really lent itself to what we were doing this morning with, the, with those that came forward and a diverse group there that came forward. Henry said it, he hadn't been 60 years. He, he just said that because he can't remember how many years it's been. <laughs> He's not sure. But we had a very diverse group that come up here, with, and I wanted that. I wanted to, them to hear from, from older and younger and men and ladies and, and, and to hear a, a, a diversity. But again, I want to encourage you. You may be sitting there going, boy, somebody should have said this. Yeah, you're that somebody. So write them a card and write that in that card. And, uh, and, and give that to them on Wednesday. Let them, let them take those home and open them up. I don't know about you. I like getting cards. I like, I, like a, I like a card that somebody writes in, not just a name. I like when there's a, there's a message in there. In fact, I got a birthday card this week. The church sends out birthday cards. I think y'all are aware of that, right? And I got my birthday card from the church, and I opened it up, and it said, To my favorite pastor, <laughs> signed Conrad. <laughs> We like getting a card. We like getting encouragement. We like that. Nobody else said their favorite pastor. It was just me, but that's okay. <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians. This message this morning, this, this text this morning as we look at, Paul is, is really going to do some encouraging. We're going to get an intro into uh, 1 Corinthians, into the, the, the city of Corinth. But it's really uh, Brianna and Jesse and Caleb, this is, this is kind of targeted to you. But it's targeted for all of us this morning. So, so I hope as, you, as you're listening this morning, don't tune out and go, oh, this is for the graduates today. This is for all of us today, okay? So let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer right here and uh, ask the Lord to give clarity. Father, thank you again for this morning. Thank you for just the work of, of uh, the Holy Spirit in our midst. Thank you for preparing us through the worship time, through the songs of praise and adoration for you. And Lord, now as we open up... Uh, open up your scriptures and we look into your word. I pray that, Father, you will uh, reveal to us what it is you want us to hear. Lord, I, I know what I'm going to be sharing, but Lord, I know you can take what I say and it can be heard a whole different way for each person. They can, Lord, you can make them hear exactly what you want them to hear. And uh, Father, I pray for each one of us that we would just submit ourselves to you right now. We would humbly come before your word and, and expectantly, right now, Lord, we would expect we come with an attitude of expectation to hear from God Almighty. Lord, you're not silent ever through your word, never. And, and while the speaker may, may not be as gifted as others, and, 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 and Lord, I know that your word doesn't return void. So as we open your word this morning, I pray, God, that you'll take it, you'll use it, and in each life, you'll do what needs to be done. As we humbly come, may we then obediently respond. And Father, I pray you'll do a great work in each and every heart this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll begin at verse 1. We'll read the first two verses and as we get started. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. We talked about Sosthenes and, and how he had, was, a, was a leader in the... In the um, in the synagogue there, and it appears there was a man named Sosthenes who was a leader in the synagogue, and then we find him writing about Sosthenes, our brother. Uh, some, no one can definitively say, but I think, it's, I think it's very well within our speculation to believe that Sosthenes, who was the leader there in the synagogue, got saved. He came to faith in Christ, and now he's with Paul, and he's with him as in. He's not there in Corinth. They're actually writing from Ephesus, and they're writing back to Corinth, so it's just neat to see the work that God had done there in, in in Corinth, and now Sosthenes is with Paul as he writes this letter. In verse 2, he says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. He's writing there to the church, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who, and now, so it's not just to the, the church in Corinth. Here he says, now look at who else he's writing to, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. This letter is not just written to the church at Corinth. It's written to every church that was in the area. It was written to every church in the world. It's written to us today. This letter is applicable to us, as is all scripture, folks. We've got to understand when we read the scriptures and we read these letters, we want to know who wrote it and why they wrote it and who they wrote it to and what was the situation of it and what was the cultural things going on what's the you know when we look at all the grammar we look at all that stuff that's the hermeneutics of of, of understanding the scriptures 
And, and we also know this, the scripture should never mean for us what it didn't mean for them. We can't read on to scripture. That's called eisegesis, not exegesis. When we start putting on the scriptures what we want them to say. So we take the scripture, we find out what Paul's saying, what he's writing, what whoever wrote, wrote, why they wrote, why the Holy Spirit told them to write that. And then we learn from that. We learn the principle from that. And that applies to our life today. These things are applicable to us. So when he writes this, this letter wasn't just to them. And Paul, led of the Holy Spirit, even says that. And with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ. So this is for us today. Now, overall, 1 Corinthians in its original context looks strikingly like our modern day setting. The church in Corinth was facing issues much like the ones we face. And as we read through this, you're going to, probably no other letter that's written in the New Testament is going to be as applicable. And as we read it, you're going to be, wow, that's just like he wrote that for us. Because we're going to read so many of the same problems that they were facing or things we face today. Some of them being, how should we handle disagreements among God's people? Wow, well, we don't have any of that, do we? Oh, wait, we do. We do. What, do. what does a Christian sexual ethic look like when promiscuity and sexual sin is the cultural norm? Well, we don't face that. Well, yeah, we face that too. How should the gospel shape our marriage? We, we face that issue. How should the gospel face how we respond in our marriage? What are the roles in marriage? How should we act? How should we treat each other? It affects all that. How can the gospel tear down barriers, tear down barriers that we have built between ourselves and others? These are the things that Paul's dealing with. And Paul sets out to answer these and other questions for them, for the church there at Corinth, but for us today. So as we go through this study, this is going to be helpful for us in, in how do we live out our faith? How do we live out our faith in the context of this church setting? We're going to learn that. He writes again, he writes specifically to the church of God, which is in Corinth, and generally to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. So a little research reveals that the city of Corinth shared much in common with the cities of our own time. Now, Corinth was a city of aspiration. Aspiration, I'll explain this. So its citizens were looking to advance on the ladder of upward social mobility, and they did this by aspiring to wealth for the sake of establishing their own honor. Boy, does that sound familiar? It sounds a lot like the culture we're in today. One commentator says the core community and core tradition of the city culture were those of trade, business, entrepreneurial pragmatism, in the pursuit of success. That's what Corinth was about. T.B. Savage said, perhaps no, no city in the empire offered so congenial an atmosphere for individual and corporate advancement. That's what it was all about. David Garland gives us a feel for the culture of the city and the way it overlaps with our own experience in America. He says, to use terms from American culture, schmoozing, massaging a superior's ego, rubbing shoulders with the powerful, pulling strings, scratching each other's backs, and dragging rivals' names through the mud all describe what was required to attain success in this society. This is Corinth. This is 2,000 years ago, and yet this sounds like a letter could be written in any church, read in any church today, uh, of the things going on in our own culture and society. Along with striving for wealth and personal honor, Corinth was a city of exploration. It had a worldly and sophisticated spirit, and it had religious diversity. Being a, a center for trade, Corinth was occupied and regularly visited by a diverse group of people from all walks of life. Now, Corinth contained a variety of religious faith communities so that the everyday citizen had any number of options um, concerning which religion or belief system might best fit him. Again, does that sound familiar? I mean, and more and more today, we, 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 I'm amazed at the number of belief systems that, that are out there today uh, trying to draw people in. Oh, the different religions and the different cults that have been established and even the political things that are going on that are trying to pull people into what they believe. This sounds very familiar to today. Garland goes on and he states that as a cosmopolitan city, Corinth was a religious melting pot with older and newer, newer religions flourishing side by side. They could choose from a great cafeteria line of religious practices. So by these descriptions, Corinth looked a lot like the self-centered culture in which we live in today, right here 
in, in central Florida. I don't even have to look around far. That looks like the culture we walk in every day that we work in. So, folks, as we read this letter, as we look at what Paul is writing, when we think about Corinth, we could say Geneva. This letter could be written to Geneva. It could be written to Sanford or Oviedo or, or Mims or Orlando. This is, this is us today. It's in our area. Um, the ideal of the Christian citizen was the reckless development of the individual. It's all about the individual, the merchant who may profit by any means necessary. The man of pleasure pursued and fulfilled every lust. The athlete committed, his bo committed to bodily exercise, and, and he was proud of his physical strength and appearance. Also, the people of Corinth recognized no superior and had no law but their own desires. Boy, we are in a culture today that has thrown off law. And we see more and more and more with the, even in, in some areas of our country where the law itself is saying, well, we're not going to prosecute that. Or we're not going to, we're going to just turn a blind eye to the law. Look, if, if we're a nation of law and order and you throw out the law, then there is no order. And that's where we're getting to where folks are just, I mean, you, you, you say, Pastor, are you sure about that? Have you ridden on I-4 lately? That's all, or 46. They're, they're, they've thrown off any, any recognition of law or, or, you know, the speeding, the cutting folks off, or whatever. All these things are, are, are just, that's where they were, that's where we are. They aspired to wealth and position and explored the many options the world offered. It is into this context that Paul speaks. And he'll be dealing with difficult situations that have been brought into the church from the sinful culture surrounding them. He's, he's going to deal with these things that are coming into the church that are a part of the culture around them. Folks, if we go to other countries, the churches are going to be influenced by the culture. It, but they're going, to have, they're going to have different cultural influence than we do. But when you let the culture influence the church, you're going to have sin. That's what we're talking about is the culture around us, the, 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 the way that people, this lost, sinful world is living, this sinful, worldly system, what of that is being brought into the church? It should not be. Now, I don't know that we can really help some of it because we live in it. But what we have to do is discern through Scripture what is and isn't to be. And this is, the, this is the situation Paul's now having to deal with, with these problems. He's going to begin to address them and help the church understand that's worldly, this is biblical. This is the right way to do it. This is the godly way to do it. This is the Christian way to do it. And he's going to deal with these things. And that's where we're launching into as we study this. Um, but surprisingly, before Paul deals with the problems, he opens this letter with great encouragement for the believers that are there in Corinth. His words of encouragement are applicable to, for us today and especially for our graduates. So I, I encourage you again, to, if you're a graduate, I encourage you all, but graduates, tune into these things because some of the truths here that Paul is speaking, what he's encouraging the church in Corinth in, and for each one of us, what he's encouraging them is going to help us in our daily walk. So that's what we want to look at. So the first thing I'm looking at here is the truth of encouragement. All right, so encouragement, what does that mean? To be encouraged or encouragement, the word encouragement means the action of giving someone support, confidence, or hope. You ever have somebody, just, you know, having a bad day and they say, hey, man, God's got this. Hey, man, I'm praying for you. Hey, hey, you know what? God still loves you. You know what? The sun came up this morning, right? So things aren't as bad as you think they are. And, and so, so there's the encouragement. You ever been down and just a phone call from somebody picks you up? You ever got some folks in your life that they just call you at the right time? This is how I can tell. This is how you know whether you got a good call or not, okay? This is what usually happens, Right? The phone rings and you look and you do one of two things. You go, oh. or you go, man, you smile. There are folks that when I see the phone ring, it just makes me smile. And there's others when it rings, when it says scam likely, I don't smile at that one. That one doesn't make me smile. That, that's not usually encouragement, but I'm glad they can find me everywhere I go. They're really worried about my, my extended warranty on my car. They're, they're, they, that shouldn't be encouraging to me because they really care. But uh, we see that. And there are folks that just, their, their voice will encourage us. There's folks that, you know, I shared about Eric Stitz, the pastor at First Baptist Daytona. Eric is one of those guys in my life that every time we talk, it just, I just feel better. I'm just encouraged. I mean, he just has that effect. 
And I would desire to be that type of person. And, and it's a desire that I'm working on. The things I want to be that type of person for people. When they see me, that when you see my call, you're not going, oh. You're going, hey, that's preacher. So courage, encouragement is a basic need. It's something we all need. We need to be encouraged. And few people flourish without affirmation, approval, or some external declaration of worth. So we long to be, uh, to be in inherently valued. We want to be valued. We want to know that. We long to have someone say, I approve of who you are. We want to hear that. We want to know that somebody approves of who we are. We want to be respected for the contributions we make. You know, We want to hear, I, I approve of what you do. I appreciate what you do. I'm thankful for what you do. I see what you do. Thank you for that. Thank you for, Jesse, thank you for taking out the trash. Thank you for cutting the grass without having me in ass. Those things, it's, 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 we give that approval that I approve of, of what you do. I approve of the way you're living your life. I'm, I'm proud of the way you're living your life. Those things, those words. And we deeply desire for assurance that we're headed in the right direction. Amen. I mean, we want that affirmation. We want, we want you know, I, I, I approve. You want to hear this. I approve of where you are heading. Now, if you don't approve where somebody's heading, you don't approve of where they're going, the things they're doing, the choices they're making, we shouldn't encourage them and, and, and reinforce what they're doing with a, that affirmation. We should help them to understand that. So, so Paul is going to have some hard things to say to the Corinthians in the pages ahead. So, but, so, so what he does is he begins this letter in a very surprising way, with a well-rounded dose of encouragement to these believers. Now, here's number one of his encouragement. He, he speaks to their Christian identity. All right, so if you, if you look at verse 2, he said, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Those who are saints. He's talking to believers. And he's talking to them there, and he says, he says, look, he's identifying. This is your identity. You are a child of God. He reminds them that they have been set apart by God, that they are important and unique because someone has declared them to be. And it just so happens in this case that someone is God. God has said you're important because he has called them. He has called them to be saints, and they have been sanctified in Christ Jesus in their relationship with him. Now, in the Corinthian culture, identity was something that was very very important. It was, it was, that was the whole part of driving their aspirations. I want to, I want to have a big job because that makes me look good in culture. I want to make a lot of money because it makes me look good in culture. And it was everything to do with how you looked, what you had, who you associated with. Corinth was that way. Wow. It sounds a lot like America today, isn't it? So it was, identity was very, very important. And, and, um, Though all the surrounding voices might tell them otherwise, to be sanctified in Christ, what he's saying there here, this is past tense. Okay, You have been sanctified. Who are sanctified? He didn't say you're going to be sanctified later. He said you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. He's speaking past tense. And, it, and, and to be sanctified in Christ was to have already received the ultimate word of approval, acceptance, and identity encouragement. Graduates, as, as, as a child of God, what more encouragement do you need? What better identity do you have or, or, or need in life than to know that you are a child of God? You're His. You have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. They were called to be saints, and this meant that their identity and purpose was externally bestowed upon them. Rather than working to build their identity or to self-manufacture a sense of purpose, they had received theirs by way of the gracious call of God. Christ took their sin, and he gave them his righteousness. That's what he's done for us. Folks, if we're, if we're a child of God, if we're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has taken away our sin. He has given us his righteousness and our identification, who we are, who we identify as, is a child of God. I am a child of God. Who in here, you know, if you, if you were a child of a king somewhere, wouldn't proclaim it. You would wear that. You would, people would know that. You are. If you've been born again, you are a child of the King of Kings. You are a child of the Lord of Lords, the Lord Almighty. You are His child. And it's not because of what you've done. It's not, you don't, it's not something you have to work for. It's not something you have to work to maintain. 
He has given that freely through your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your identity is in Christ. Your identity, our identity, is found in Christ. Who am I? Now, the world around us has rejected Christ, and, they, and thus they've rejected their identity as his creation. And we see the, just the absolute insanity, folks, that's going on right now with this. If you don't think in, your identity is important, understanding who you are in Christ, look at the world around us and what's going on there. The, 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 now, what Paul was dealing with wasn't necessarily the same identity stuff that we're dealing with today. I mean, we got folks that are that 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 in our culture they're 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 struggling with identifying their gender. The most simple, basic, scientific thing, and they just can call themselves something else. Um, and it's not just. Males that want to identify as, no, I'm a female. No, you're not. Folks, we're in a culture where a, a person, a person, I don't know if it's a woman or not, because she couldn't identify what a woman was. When you have someone who's a candidate for the Supreme Court who can't define what a woman is, and yet that person was still voted onto the Supreme Court. We've lost our ever-loving minds in this country. Identity. So I'm not sure if I'm a male or if I'm a female. Or today I might be one. It's fluid. It's just not how, I don't know. Folks, it's, it's, it's not just that. But I don't know if you've heard this. We have, we have some, some schools in America have, uh, have put litter boxes in the restrooms. I, I've heard it is true. There are kids who are wearing tails who are identifying as animals. I'm a cat or I'm a dog. Or, and they're not just saying I'm doing that. They're identifying as these things. And there are some schools that have done this. And it may not be true. But I'd be more amazed if it's not true than if it is true with where we're at today. So it is true that they're identifying as animals. That's absolutely true. I'm a, I'm a cat today. And they're licking themselves. And there's some that are identifying as objects. So we, we're struggling in America today with identity. Why is that? Because we've re rejected the identity that Christ offers us. Our identity is in Him. Who am I? Who am I? Listen. If you're a believer, embrace who you are. And who you are is a child of God. God so loved, he sent. Jesus so loved, he died. He took our place. He died for us. He paid our sin debt and he rose from the dead. And he offers us eternal life through repentance and confession of our sin turning to Christ, calling on the name of the Lord, and, and we can be born again. And when you have that, then who are you? You're a child of the King. You're a child of God. You know, I think about who you are. I think about that song we, we sing uh, when we sing, You're a Good, Good Father. It says, You're a good, good father, and I am loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. Who am I? I'm loved by God. That's our identity. Man, embrace that. Hold on to that. That is the encouragement we need, folks, because then I don't get lost. I don't get sucked into the things of the world. I'm not struggling with who I am because who I am is Christ's. I belong to him. I'm a child of the king. It's not pride. It's not pride because I didn't do anything. He did it all, and he saved me, and I'm his child. And man, if you're a child of God... Uh, if I'm a child of God and I'm loved by God and I'm his and he has accepted me, my identity is in him, not in me. And it's not in outside things. It's in him. And, and that's Paul's encouragement. The second thing Paul encourages here is their God-given aptitude. 
their aptitude. Now, for each of us, the thing that lies beyond the question of identity, the, the who am I, is the question of aptitude, and that's what am I to do? What am I going to do with my life? And that's, that's the question each one of these graduates now ask. This, this is a big deal. Don't, don't get me wrong. This is a big deal. Graduating high school is a big deal. But in about four or five years, you're going to go, boy, that wasn't as big a deal as I thought it was. You're, I mean, but you've got some major decisions right now to make. And the decisions you make, the trajectory, trajectory we're going to talk about in a moment, the, which direction are you heading in? It's important as you make these decisions right now. What am I going to do? Whether you go to school or whether you go to trade school, whether you get a job or whatever it is, these things, the decisions you make today are going to affect down the road. But it's your, it's your aptitude. What am I to do? So aptitude is typically made up of the collection of gifts, skills and abilities that you have been given combined with the steps you have taken to further develop them. Now, when we talk about gifts, spiritual gifts, someone, I think Greg spoke about spiritual gifts this morning, the gifting of how God has spiritually gifted you. As a child of God, he's gifted you. He's given you those gifts. He's given you skills. There are things that you can do that maybe someone else can't do. You have abilities. All the things, all those things that you have, none of them you gave yourself. So when you understand that the gifting that you have is from God, it's going to help us. Paul speaks to the Corinthians there in verse 5, and he says that they have been enriched in everything by him, in all utterance and all knowledge. He was telling them, in that culture, being able to speak, being able to speak well, being able to be a, was a big deal. God had given them Everything they needed, enhanced them in everything, in all utterance and all knowledge. He had given them the, the knowledge to debate their faith. He had given them the ability to speak it. Folks, he's given you that. He's given you just what you need. You are what God has created you to be. Now, I was telling our class this morning, um, Tiger Woods was given a gift from God of hand-eye coordination that's probably off the charts. I mean, if you had a rating of 100 of hand-eye coordination, he's probably a 110. I mean, the, the things that he, the, the hand-eye coordination control, I could hit a golf ball 20 hours a day for 20 years and not have the ability he has. He has been given abilities that then he has honed and developed and worked. You're no different Yours are just, you've got to figure out what abilities do I have. Develop those. What spiritual gifts do I have? We need to walk and function in the spiritual gifting that God has given us. We need to identify these things. God has, has given us these gifts. He's given us these skills. He's given us these abilities. And he's even allowed us to experience things in life that teach us, that mold us, that shape us. And we go, boy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go through that again. But we probably wouldn't trade it for anything because of the way God uses it to, to, to make us and to shape us into who we are. Here was the problem the Corinthians had. They started thinking their, their abilities maybe was something special about them. They got proud in their abilities. And then they began to think, well, it's my abilities and it's about me that then affected their identity. And their identity then was in themselves. It was self-focused. It was about me and you know, because I'm good at this or I do that well. Find out how God has gifted you. And then you, you follow the Lord in that. You function in the gifting because he has equipped you. He's given you everything you need. Follow, follow what God is doing and what he has done in your life. Then the third thing is he speaks of, Paul speaks of, is their ultimate trajectory. Now, now when you combine identity and aptitude, you're going you're gonna to get some type of a forward motion. You have who you are and you have what you can do. There's going to be some type of forward motion. And, and, and we're all heading somewhere. And the question that we long for, the, the, the answer we want to hear in our heads or we want somebody to share with us is this, is where am I headed? What does my future hold? How can I know that my trajectory is worthwhile? Uh, is it reasonable for me to be hopeful about my destination? And what Paul says is this in verse 8. Paul answers these questions for the Corinthians when he claims that Jesus will also confirm you to the end. That word means establish you. He's going to keep you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying, folks, 
If you're a child of God, your ending is secure. The end of the story is secure. Man, there is, I don't know if y'all, some of you would remember the message I preached where, where the Lord is calling Moses. And he's telling him to go down and bring the children of Israel out. And Moses is kind of, he's whining as Moses would do. He would whine a little bit and he was insecure. And Lord, I can't do that and I can't speak well. And, and you know, he's this and the Lord says, he gives him all these different things. He takes away all his excuses. But ultimately he tells Moses this, look, you're going to go down, you're going to bring them out. And here's going to be the sign to you that that's going to happen is that you're going to come back and you're going to worship me on this mountain. What God said is, I ain't telling you what's going to happen between here and there, but you're going to be back here, and you're going to worship me on this mountain. I'm telling you how the story ends. I'm not going to tell you every step of the way, but I'm telling you how the story ends. Folks, graduates, here's the deal. Understand your identity. Embrace what God has done in your life, the abilities he's given you, the, the way he has shaped you and molded you and what he is doing in your life. Follow him, but know this. Your end is secure. Amen. You're not going to lose that. Now, that's not, a, that's not a freebie to, now I'm going to go get living sin now. And I know I'm, listen, once saved, always saved. I was talking about this in class this morning too. And, and I've heard people say for years, yeah, you Baptist and you all believe that once saved, always saved. Yeah, I do. I believe that. You know why? Because the Bible teaches that. It doesn't teach if I'm going down the road and, 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 and somebody cuts me off and I think something I shouldn't think, all of a sudden I'm lost. And then I hit a deer and I crash and I die and I go to hell doesn't teach that. It teaches that when I'm born again, I am born again. There's nothing I can do. There's nothing Jesse can do to not be my son. He was born into the family. When you are born again, you are a part of the family, and your ending is settled. But you got to be once saved to be always saved. You got to know that you have eternal life. The scriptures are clear. Says that I've written these things to you that you may know that you have eternal life. If you're sitting here going, somebody asked you, do you do you know where you're going to spend eternity? If your answer is, well, I hope this, or I think that, or maybe this, you ain't saved. Because when we come to a place of salvation, when we really understand, first of all, i got to understand I'm a sinner and I'm hopeless. In myself, there's nothing I can do. We come to that place, we hear the gospel, Christ died for me, it's nothing I do. Christ died for me and he has made a way. And if we confess our sin, we repent of our sin and we call on him, he'll save us. We can know that we have eternal life. You ought to know this morning. And if you don't know, then you need to know before you leave here today. You need to know that you have eternal life. Paul encourages them in who they were in Christ. He encourages them with their abilities and their talents and their aptitude that he, God, gave them. Man, I don't come, I got hair thinning right here. I got it thinning right here. I got it growing out my ears like you wouldn't believe. It's falling out here and growing out here. So, but I, don't, I ain't going to complain about it because, listen, God made me the way I am. Now, there's some things I can work on. I appreciate Jason. I appreciate you, Jason. Jason, Wednesday night, he said, hey, brother, you putting on a little weight. <laughs> Why, yes, I am, Jason. I appreciate, <laughs> and I appreciate you noticing. <laughs> he was encouraging me. He said, get back on your diet. Get back to work. You, you dropped the ball, brother. Pick it up. And he was telling me how he's, how, he's doing real well with his so Jason, you look good, man. You look good. You. you gained a little weight. No. <laughs> Understand how you've been gifted, what God has done in your life. Understand, embrace that. Pursue what he has made you to be. Don't complain about it. So what if you're not 6'3"? I've heard 6'3", six, three, six, three people complain about, man, I have the hardest time finding suits and things that fit. Everybody's got something to complain about. Quit complaining. Embrace who you are. God made you that way. Amen. Embrace it. Even Henry. <laughs> I just have fun with Henry because he has fun with me. So we, we have fun with each other. Embrace, embrace it. And listen, when you understand who you are in Christ, 
and you embrace who he's made you to be and how he's gifted you, look, you can be on the right trajectory. You can do the things. Pursue the things he's called you to do and created you to do. Do those things. Don't get caught up in what the Corinthians were caught up in with, man, aspiring to more and more and more. Uh, look, we're, we're to work. Scripture teaches to work, provide, store up, all those things. But that shouldn't be my God. That shouldn't be what I aspire to. That, that, that's not, man, that 401K, boy, if, you, if that's your security, you ain't feeling very secure these days, are you? <laughs> wow, I've lost 25% this year, I think. Somewhere in that neighborhood. Might be a little more. Might be more than that. Gosh, I'm going to quit thinking about it. But you know what? I can still smile because my security ain't tied up in my 401k. I may never retire, but I, I never plan to retire anyway. I'm going to go till I can't go no more. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not going to go rock away. I'm going to burn away. I wanna go, I'm going to go till I can't go anymore. And we ought to all do that. So Paul's encouraging them. And Paul, he essentially says this. He said, regardless of what you bring to the table, God finds you incredibly valuable and worthy of investment. And on top of that, he's going to ensure that you are sustained and carried through to a joy-filled life and eternity with him. That's Man, that ought to bless our hearts this morning. We ought to be encouraged by that this morning, that, that who my identity is, who I am in Christ. My security doesn't come by my beautiful wife. It doesn't come by having great kids. It doesn't come by being a pastor. It doesn't come by, it, by the certain relationships or how the public sees me. None of that. My security is in Christ. That's who I am. I'm a child of God. We should pursue that. We should hold on to that, embrace that. Now, real quick, and I'm going to finish up here. Paul, the basis of Paul's encouragement, because we look at you know, Paul speaking these words of encouragement. He's giving the scripture. He's saying these, these are scriptures for our life. But look at this. The basis of Paul's encouragement uh, to the Corinthian church is that their past, present, and future have been confirmed, declared, secured, enriched, and sustained in Christ. Not in themselves. Let's look at how just how Christ-saturated his words are. All of the realities of Paul's encouragement are grounded in Christ. The Christian's identity is not self-made or self-sustained. It is the result of an outside action of God on our behalf. Amen? Verse 2, we are sanctified not in ourselves but in Christ. Look there in verse 2. In Christ Jesus also in verse 2, we are called to be saints, not because we are inherently saintly, but simply because we call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Verse 3, the grace and peace we experience is delivered to us from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where our grace and peace comes from. His grace and he brings peace. They're delivered to us from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4, the grace we experience has not, was not earned, but was a gift given to us by Christ Jesus. Verse 5, our speech and knowledge are enriched by him. We have been enriched in all things. Folks, you have everything you need. You have exactly what God wanted you to have. Now embrace that. Embrace who you are in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, we're confident in our faith because God confirmed the testimony of Christ among us. Verse 7, our future hope is not in our manifold gifts or in the potential of our achievements, but in the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, God sustains us to the end. Verse 8, he has promised to make us, now us, the guilty, to make us blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's what he does. It's nothing we do that makes us blameless. It's what he did. Verse 9, and we are absolutely certain of this because God is faithful. There in verse 9, God is faithful, and he has called us into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what does that mean for us? It means that our status as sanctified and saints is not based upon our work, but upon the work of Christ. Our identity is sure because it was given to us by Christ. 
Our gifts are sure and sufficient because they are given to us by the Holy Spirit of God. And our future is secure because it has been prepared for us by the one who holds the future in his hands. The gospel is absolutely counter to our culture that runs on self-definition, self-help, and self-realization. Self, 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 me, me, me. The gospel is counter to that. Our identity is in Christ. In the gospel, God declares us uh, presentable before he even looks at our record. The gospel says, stop striving to build an identity. You have been given one free of charge because of the striving of Jesus Christ in your place. You You no longer have to live to build an identity, but you can live up to the identity that has been given to you. Folks, we can, we can live in the identity that Christ has given us. I, tell, I say this morning, as we, Pastor Aaron, you and the team, whoever needs to come can come. This morning, it, your identity should be in Christ. And if it's not in Christ, if it's not in Christ because you as a, as a, you're sitting here and you've never placed your faith in Christ, this morning, this is the time. Today is the day. You're not promised tomorrow. And this morning, I would encourage you, if if you've never come to that place of trusting Jesus Christ with your eternal soul, then I would plead with you, when we start in just a moment and we start this time of invitation, I beg you to step out, come down here. One of us, if it's a lady, my wife will talk with you. If it's a man, I'll talk with you. We'll have one of our men, somebody else will talk with you. We'll share. We'll just take the scriptures, open up and share with you the scriptures. Point you right to Christ. Introduce you to this morning. You can settle that today. Believer, maybe maybe you're struggling with your identity in Christ. I hope Paul's words were an encouragement to you this morning. Hope what Paul's saying, you are a child of God. Your identity is in him. It's not in what you have or what you do, where you go or who you know. It is in him. Embrace that. Hold to that. And this morning, maybe you need to confess, Lord, my identity, I've allowed that to be something else. I've allowed something else to steal that from you. My identity is in you, Lord. It needs to be in you. Maybe this morning would be a good time to confess that to him and get that right. Come back to him, embracing who you are in Christ. As we stand, I just... uh, If you'll stand with me. We'll have this time here in a moment. This this is an altar here. This altar is open. And I say that because I want you to understand if God's doing something in your heart. You you can kneel right there. But I think there's something powerful. I think there's something powerful about coming to an altar. that, that, That movement in response to what God is doing in your heart. It's that action that follows the moving. It's what he is saying to do, that obedience of yes, yes, Lord. Maybe you need to come this morning and just spend some time talking to the Lord this morning. But the altar's open. It's always open. If you need to talk to somebody, if you need somebody to pray with you, we're here to pray. If you need somebody to introduce you to Christ, we'd love to do that this morning. So whatever God's doing in your heart, please, please don't put it off. Father, I pray you'll just bless and move now in this time of invitation as we respond to what you're doing in our lives, in our hearts. Lord, move in us and move us. In Jesus' name I pray.